Once again, we give all praise, honor, and glory to our righteous and heavenly Father for once again giving us this opportunity to go into his word, to literally hear what it is that he has to say to us and to give us a sense of encouragement and direction for the times that we are facing in our lives. We thank God that you have um, carved out time in your, in your schedules to sit at the master's feet and to hear what thus says the Lord. For this is the day that the Lord has made and we ought to rejoice and be glad that we are here this day. And I am excited to once again hear what God has to say to us. Uh, once again, I, I greet each and every one of you during this time um, and this season. I pray that God has been keeping, keeping you and protecting you from all danger seen and unseen. Well, let's get right into our word, into the word of God. Um, Pastor Lester has been uh, graciously um, and uh, strategically walking us through the book of Joshua and to continue with the same path and the pattern that he is that has been laid before us. We are going to continue to go into the book of Joshua. I want to look at Joshua It's going to be actually like a uh, almost like a a rewind for what Pastor Lester talked about, of course, with a different twist. I'm looking at the uh, passage of Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, we're looking at Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to be reading from Eugene Peterson's Message Bible. It says, Joshua was up early and on his way from Shittim with all the people of Israel with him. He arrived at the Jordan and camped before before crossing over and after three days leaders went through the camp and gave out orders to the people when you see the covenant chest of god your god carried by the levitical priests start moving and follow it make sure you keep a proper distance between you and it about half a mile be sure now to keep your distance and you'll see clearly the route to take. You've never been on this road before. You've never been on this road before. Wow, such a powerful statement that God has given to Joshua in his conversation with him. Looking at jo Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. Let's open up with a quick word of prayer. O most gracious Heavenly Father, we once again come to you this afternoon, this morning, to pause and to thank you and to bless and praise you for always being there right, right with us. Thank you for keeping us and guiding us and for protecting us for putting the hedge of protection over our lives, for covering us, Lord God, from things that are around us that are dangerous, and even those things that are not visibly seen. We bless your name, and we honor and we love you for just being who you are in our lives. And so, God, as we pause to prepare to go into your word, I pray, God, that you will be glorified. People, this day, will be edified. And Satan will be horrified. God, speak with my mind. Speak with my tongue and think with my mind. Use me, Lord God, to proclaim truth from the truth. About the truth. We give you all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are once again in the life of Joshua. And as I continue to really study the book of Joshua, I begin to really have some uh, struggles when it comes to the Lord. I, I struggle in this text specifically because based upon what I know about God and based upon what I've learned about the Lord, my belief system was basically 
that when I go through situations in life, and when I do what he has me to do, that he would literally not make it complicated. Some of the things that when he gives me a, a specific instruction um, about something that he wants me to do and they want me to do for him and that I am willing to do so, my belief is that the doors will be opened wide open off of the hinges. And what's, what I'm beginning to learn is that the reality is it doesn't happen that way. And so as a result, I have these struggles, these battles with God because my belief and my expectation is it shouldn't be as complicated, as hard as it is, especially when you, Lord, are telling me to do X, Y, and Z. Case in point, here's a case in point for you. Many of you know that uh, for years I have been in school and here it is that um, I'm coming towards the, um, I'm in the last leg of school now going for my doctoral degree. And for years, I, 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 I decided not to go to school because of the personal intimidation that I had based upon the stories that I've heard uh, from other individuals who are going to school for their doctoral degree. And so after a certain point, I really felt that the Lord was placing on my heart that this is what it is that he would have me to do, that he had a plan for my life. And part of the plan that he had for my life, also he was incorporating um, my education in the midst of it. And so after getting the reassurance that this is what God has for me to do, I went on and I enrolled in school and I did it. However, since I've been in there, it has been extremely complicated. In fact, it was more challenging and much harder than I even anticipated. And so in my opinion, based upon being in here, I thought that it was going to be a lot more easier than what it is. But the reality is it doesn't happen that way. And so this is where my struggle lies, because, Lord, if you're telling me to do this and you have your reasons, even if you don't tell me why, but if you're telling me to do these things and you give me a particular commandment that you would have me to face, that you would have me to obey, why is it that it is so complicated? Why is it that you're making it make me feel that based upon what it is you have me to do is literally becoming impossible? This is what's going on in today's text. Because according to the text, Joshua is in a position where God is literally challenging him to go somewhere and to go to a place where he's never been before. And the major part to all of this is this. God said it in his word, verse number four, that after you keep the proper distance from the Ark of the Covenant and keep a distance between you and it, about a half a mile, he says, according to the text, to keep the distance because basically what I'm doing is that I'm placing you on a path that you've never been before. Joshua, according to this text, as we know, is a man of action. And Joshua has been obedient to the word of God and he has had no problems when it came to following God's word. We know all this. We also know that just upon historically speaking, just as he followed the instructions from God to Moses, he's now at a point in his life where he's literally following instructions straight from God himself. In other words, there is no middleman at this particular point. 
all Joshua's life, he lived under the tutelage and the leadership of Moses. But if y'all remember, according to Joshua chapter one, God told Joshua, Moses, my servant is now dead, which means the one who you was getting instructions from is gone. And as a result of him now being gone, now any instructions that are going to come forth is not going to come through the line of somebody else, but it's going to come straight from me. Which suggests this, Joshua, it was important for Joshua at this particular moment to have a sensitive ear for the voice of God. In other words, he had to have a personal encounter with God himself so that he would know and he would be able to recognize the voice of God when God was given some instructions that he wanted him to know. My question to you is this. The first thing is this, sanctuary. Are you, are you going straight to God yourself when God has put somebody over you that he's already given instructions to? In other words, you and I have the right and we have the ability and the privilege to go to God ourselves for specific instructions. But based upon where we're at uh, spiritually, God has literally put a hedge, a covering over us, in this case, that being Pastor Lester. And so therefore, because of the fact of divine order, God has given somebody, placed somebody over you and what he is desiring and expecting for you to do at this particular moment is not only be obedient and listen to the voice of God for yourself, but also listen to the voice of God through the one who is over you. Ah, I just said something there. Because some people, some people, not people here, we're in sanctuary, but some people feel that they don't have to listen to the voice of the leader. But God placed individuals over us for a particular purpose. And because of the fact that they have been placed over us, and in this case, we trust and believe God is speaking to our shepherd, then therefore we ought to listen as well to what the shepherd has to say. But we're not here to talk about that. We're going to continue to move on with Joshua. And so here it is. It says in the text that... Joshua has been a man of action and he has been obedient to the word of God and he has no problem with following God's instructions. But now what happens is God puts Joshua in a peculiar predicament where he's leading him down a path that he's never been before. And so what Joshua does is that Joshua then makes preparation. And so, according to the word of God, after the spies returned from spying out of the land, Joshua, and he got the word after they came back from doing recon, based upon what they said and based upon what God had told him, Joshua then began to make immediate preparations to cross over Jordan to invade Canaan. Now, Joshua has no idea of how he would get the, the massive group of people across the swollen Jordan River. All he knows is that God told him this. And so therefore, because this is what God said, this is what he's going to do. And so believing that God would somehow, some way make it possible, Joshua moved not on personal instinct, but based upon the voice of God, he moved them all, bag and baggage, the seven miles necessary from Shittim to the Jordan River. You can only imagine how that transition went. That here it is, you had these massive amount of individuals who was comfortable and complacent as to where they were. 
But now the voice of God is coming through Joshua. And they are told to get their stuff together and make preparations to go to the Jordan River. You can only imagine how that went. I can only imagine the amount of questions and the hesitation and the attitudes and the and the doubt and, 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 the, and the frustration that he had to face amongst the individuals. How he had to give them a sense, give them words of encouragement and a sense of peace in the midst of an uneasy situation. And so more than likely, they need, they would need time for the leaders to organize the crossing and to pass instructions on to the people. And so with all this going on, the delay also, if you can imagine, what gives everyone an opportunity to get a closer look at what is before them. And that is the river. A closer look at this river, which was at this time of year, a strong and rapid current due to the melting of the winter snows of Mount Hebron in the north. Season has shown that the river was already massive by itself. But now, because of the transition of the seasons, and because Mother Nature is now transitioning over to warmer climates, the remains of the snow that was on the snow tops of the mountains, such as Mount Hebron, has not only evaporated into the sky, but has now trickled down into the river, thus making it even more in, more deeper than what it really was. And so in their eyes, it was already, they already felt that it was impossible to overcome the river. But because of the fact that the river has increased even more over the year, their doubt and their worry begin to escalate even more. So this is the preparation. And so now instructions are given. And instructions given at the end of the third day of waiting, people were now given instructions. And so the instructions said that the pillar of cloud, which led them, would no longer lead them. But they were instead, they were instead to follow the Ark of the Covenant. Now, when Moses was in charge, the people were led by a pillar, cloud, a pillar by day and a pillar of fire by night. There was no army scouts. No army scouts were there to advance first into the land. But in this case, it's now the priests bearing the Ark. Things are now different. In other words, tradition has now left the area. And so based upon how they used to making moves in their own personal lives, lives, that has now been relinquished. In other words, the way that they begin, the way they used to uh, worship and the way they used to uh, praise God, things has completely changed. It's just like the fact that here it is, it's a church that I sometimes had the opportunity to go down and preach at. And the church, and it's not talking bad about the church, but every time I would go there, I literally felt like that I was going back into a twilight zone. And the reason why I say that is because one of the things that the church would do in particular is that before we would go into the order of the service, they had a period where they still had testimony service. Yeah, you heard me right. They were still having testimony service. And so it just it surprised me because the people would stand up and and they would they would testify about the goodness of God and how God has kept them. And you you kind of knew you kind of knew to. The, the, the spill, the spill, if you will, it'd be constantly the same one over and over and over again. And so and so at a certain point, you know, then we would go into the service. But the thing is, is that they didn't want to transition. They liked how things 
were. They remained in the same position for so long. And it's not to say that something is wrong with the testimony service. That's not the, that's not my point here. But my point is, is that sometimes God places us in a position where he wants us to literally go through this transition. And he wants us to go through a period of change. And then sometimes that can be very, very, very uncomfortable. And so here and so that's what's going on in this case. Because the people are used to moving a particular way. And the particular way that they used to move, it included Moses. And the way Moses did things was totally opposite from what Joshua was about to do. And so since the Ark of the Covenant symbolized the Lord himself, the Ark was going to be there that they had to follow the, the direction of the Ark instead of the voice of someone like Moses. Now the Israelites, they start moving and they start walking. And so now the Israelites were confronted with a serious problem. And that problem was relating to the Jordan River. Because the Jordan River was flooded. The Bible says that the, it was flooded and it was flooded to the point where the banks overflowed. And so this posed a serious problem. And it posed a critical one. Because if it's flooded, in their eyes, it's impassable. The Jordan River represented and stood as an obstacle to the promised land. And this is uncomfortable because at this particular moment, as the people stood there and Joshua stood there, he couldn't help but to reflect back to the period of Moses, what God had promised during that period of time, that he promised that he was going to take them to a land flowing with milk and honey. He's going to take them to this promised land. And the people believed that and they and they trusted, they trusted what, what Moses was saying because they believed that what Moses said came from God. And so they trusted it. They trusted the voice of God. And so now here it is. It's time to move. And so based upon what they heard and they trusted and they believed in, they're looking at what is in front of them. And we talked about this before. But what's in front of them now is, in their eyes, a river that seems to be impossible to pass. Promised land, which represents new life for the people of God, a new way of thinking, a new relationship with the Lord. Promised land, which represents a sense of hope. In the victorious life, a life where they're able to conquer some of their previous demons and can't overcome some of their previous troubles. The promised land, a place where that represents a place of rest and healing, a place where they can have fellowship and communion and, and joy and rejoice in their security and protection. This is the promised land. Promised land, which represents place where they can get abundance and fruitness, a place where they can get a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment and a place of purpose and, and meaning and significance. All of this, the promised land. But how do you handle this obstacle that is keeping you from the promised land? Here's something that I learned. What I've learned is this. And I heard somebody say this and it blew my mind. If I can't handle being good at something, how can I be consider myself a successful per person? Let me say that one more time. If I can't handle being good at something, how can I consider myself a successful person. What does that mean? What that means is this. 
in order for me to become good at something, I have to face the fact that good doesn't come through things that are easy. But good comes and success comes through the fact that I'm facing something that is extremely hard. See, what happens is in life, and I've been learning this, what happens in life is that when we go through problems and trials and tribulations and, and we're faced with certain things, we want things to be easy. But we don't appreciate and value what God has for us until we face hard. And so the only way I can become successful and good at something, and the only way I can really overcome my fears and my hesitations, and the only way that I can really grow is that I got to face these moments where things have to be hard. It's just that simple. And in our thinking, we've been under this thinking that we're not supposed to experience hard times, hard situations, hard trials, and hard tribulations. We thought that it's supposed to be easy, but that's not what God said. And so here it is. This is where the people are at, where they can either become victims of circumstance or they can be become victors where they can be they can conquer this trial or become conquerors the only way all of this was going to happen was based upon their faith and so faith was then and now the only way that you and I can conquer our problems because by faith God will show us and will show them how to overcome the, pros the problems of the obstacles of the Jordan. And by faith, God will make sure his people will receive the promised inheritance, the victorious life of the promised land. So what the Jordan River is, the Jordan River is a picture of our problems and difficulties. The Jordan River is a pictorial illustration of the trials and the temptations that confront us through our life. And so we have these problems and we have these trials and tribulations. We have these things that we have to face in life. But the only way that we can overcome our Jordan rivers is based upon our faith. And faith is the only, is faith in God is the only way to conquer the obstacles of faith. My question to you this day is that where is your faith being placed? If your faith is based upon what you see, you are not believing what God is able to do. Faith tells us that we ought to put our total trust in him. The Bible says faith is the substance of things that are hoped for and the evidence of things that are not seen, which means we can't go based upon what we see. Because based upon what we see gives us nothing but doubt and worry. But faith goes beyond the visual, goes beyond the atmosphere, the hemisphere. And it pulls out and it pulls for what can actually occur. The only way we're able to get this is that we put our faith and trust in the Lord. And so because of faith, this is what's going on in this text. That Joshua, what Joshua was preparing the people to encounter faith like they've never encountered it before. My question to you is that how much do you really want to see God move? How much faith do you really have in him that he's able to help you overcome situations? I had to learn this myself. And this helped me with the struggles that I was having with the Lord. Because even though I expected things to be easy, my faith is increased when I experience tough times. 
Thank God for tough times, for hard times, for trials and tribulations, for Jordan River situations, because that is what helps us to put our trust in him. Where's your faith today, sanctuary? Have you been putting your faith in him? Your trust, your hope in what he has to say? Or are you going based upon what you're seeing? You become extremely frustrated and discouraged, worried, anxious. You're experiencing all these emotions because of what you see. Not based upon what God said. God said, I got a plan for you. He says, I have a plan for you. Plan that you're going to prosper. Plan that you're going to have hope and a future. He said, I don't, I'm going, I'm watching you. And I got a plan and a destiny for your life. Are you putting your faith into that? Are you only trusting what you see? If you only trust what you see, you're going to face worry. I challenge you today that whatever Jordan River, Jordan experience you're facing in your life, put your faith in him. Don't look at the intensity of the river. Look at how high and how deep it is. I get it because based upon what you see, if you jump in, in your eyes, you're thinking you're going, you're going to sink and fail, you fall. It's not going to work. I can't swim that much. I can't survive that much. That's what you see. But God said if you have the faith even the size of a mustard seed. Do you at least have mustard seed faith? And belief that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything you ask or think. Do you believe that today? I pray that you put your trust in him. And he is able to do the impossible.